People are finding your seats. I got a quote for you to chew on. He said, doxology without theology is idolatry. Okay, what does that mean? Doxology, praise, glory, worth. You got all of this and it manifests itself in excitement. People jumping around, all around here, jumping around, shouting, raising up their hands, dancing. But if they don't have theology, doctrine, who God is, what the gospel is, then all of that is idolatry. And we don't want to do that here today, right? We want to inform our conscience of the truth of Scripture and may that flow out of our hearts, doxology, praising the Lord. And today we're going to talk about the salvation and destruction of God. And that is worthy. God is worthy to be praised on His salvation and destruction. So we'll be in Jude, verse 5. You want to turn to Jude? It's the book right before the last book, Revelation. So just turn a page back if you're in Revelation 1. We'll be in Jude verse 5. It says there, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, or your translation might say, the Lord, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have providentially brought everyone who's here right now to be here. Lord, I I pray, Lord, that I would decrease, that you would increase, that your word would go forth, a double-edged sword, doing what I cannot do, doing what the greatest preacher who ever lived could stand here. They, They couldn't do what your word can do through your spirit. Father, I pray that your spirit would be here, that you would use your word to convict your people and the lost. In the name of your Son, be with us. Amen. Well, a few years ago, uh, living in Laredo, as many of you know, I was living in Laredo, I had uh, my mother-in-law coming in from out of town, so she was visiting us. And my wife, my mother-in-law, and myself, we were having a, somewhat of a focused, engaged conversation. We were talking about something. I couldn't tell you what it was about, but we were focused on that. And my mother-in-law looked back at the time. She was wanting to see what time it was. And we had a digital clock on our kitchen stove. And the time at that moment was 9-11. My mother-in-law hesitated. She looked back at us. And she said those numbers, that time, in such a way like communicating something with those numbers. She said, 9-11. Now, Megan and I, my wife and I, immediately understood what she was saying, what she was trying to communicate behind those numbers expressed in that way. She was referring to the tragic event that took place on September 11th, 2001. How many of you guys understood what she was saying when she said 9-11, right? Okay, she was communicating something with just that simple, just expressing it in such a way so as to give it significance. 9-11. Of course, Megan and I immediately understood what she was talking about. September 11, 2001, there was no need for her to talk about the Twin Towers or New York or planes crashing into buildings. Right away, we knew what she was talking about. Well, in Jude verse 5, he's going to, he does here, bring up an event. And that event did not need to be expounded on for his hearers to understand the event and even the details of the event that he was referring to. I've entitled my message today, A Reminder of God's Salvation and Destruction. And I have three points. First, our need to be reminded. That's our desperate need. We could call it our desperate need to be reminded. Second, God saved a people. Amen. God saved a people. And he, 
He continues to save today. Third, God destroyed the unbelievers. So first, our need, our desperate need to be reminded. Again, Jude, he desires his hearers to recall an event. He wants them to call into mind something, if you read the text there, something that they once fully knew. You see that? So the question would be, what event? What is he referring to? What is he talking about? Anyone? What event is this? Exodus. Exodus. Okay, thank you, Charles. Because say Exodus, the great event of the Exodus. Now, all, again, all Jude needed to say is that a people were saved out of the land of Egypt, and they knew right away, correct? Exactly what, how, the way my mother-in-law did as well. She simply said 9-11, and we knew right away. And you all knew, right? Yet, just because I myself at that moment could recall 9-11 at that time, that does not mean that I had been living my life in light of the reality of 9-11. It doesn't mean that I knew it like I once fully knew it. The truth of 9-11 was not in my heart at that moment. It wasn't even in the front of my mind. It was on my mind, but actually somewhere in the back of my mind. And it's in that sense that I didn't know it as I once fully knew it. So we, just like Jude Jude hearers at that time, are prone to forgetfulness. Are we not? I mean, okay, I haven't heard too much even when I asked about what event it was, the exodus. Who here can raise up their hand and say, I am not a forgetful person? Anyone? Okay, so then I still am not here getting any response, so let's do it the other way around. Who here can admit that we are prone to forgetfulness? Raise your hand, please. Okay, thank you. We are alive and awake today. We are all a forgetful people, right? We can all admit this. We are a forgetful people. And we constantly, because of that, need to be reminded of the truth. Even Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, his disciples needed to be reminded of the truth. What's a prime example? Okay, I need responses again. What is a prime example, the prime example, of the disciples forgetting the truth that Jesus himself taught them? Anyone? What is a prime example, an event that took place? What was it? Feeding the 5,000, but what's, okay, that's true. But what's a prime, even, even greater example of that? Uh, of something that Jesus taught them. Was that? His death, his burial, and here it is, his resurrection. Jesus Christ in the flesh taught them that he was going to be betrayed by the hand of sinful men. He taught them that he was going to die, and he taught them that he would what? Again, resurrect. He himself in the flesh I mean, you could picture it, talking to them, looking at them in their eyes, right? Just patiently walking with them and telling them, instructing them, teaching them beforehand that this very event was going to take place. Just a couple of examples of this. John 20 says there, Mary saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. The angel said to her, woman, why are you weeping? I mean... Think about this, despite Jesus Christ teaching them, teaching them and and, and explaining to them that this very thing was going to happen, all you see amongst the disciples is sorrow, despair, fretfulness, confusion, perplexity, but no recalling of this event. She's weeping here. She responds and says to to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. I mean, I don't know exactly how she expressed that, but do you hear the concern in her words? Do you hear the fear that she had? Luke 24, verses 1 through 8. Just listen. Jot it down if you want. It says there, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went, in, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. Okay, so question, why would they be taking spices? Okay, answer, because they're anticipating 
They're expecting to meet their what? A dead, stinking body. That's the reason that they would bring and prepare spices. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, they were perplexed. They were puzzled. They were confused. Okay, so here's the thing about a puzzle. You open up the box and you got a thousand different pieces, especially like my kids like to do, just throw it on the floor and there's a thousand pieces everywhere. What's the thing about the pieces of the puzzle? You don't understand how they fit together. You're confused, you're perplexed, and that's what's going on here. They don't understand why the body of the Lord Jesus is not there. Make sense? While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hand of sinful man and be crucified and on the third day rise. Note verse 8. And they remembered his word. They took it out of the back of their mind and they placed it there and remembered his words. Okay, imagine with me. We talked about 9-11. Imagine witnessing, not 9-11, not the Holocaust, not whatever event you want to deem as a great event in history. Imagine witnessing the greatest event, the event of events, the greatest event right before your eyes. And not just that. You had the Son of God himself spending time with you, teaching you patiently that that very event was going to take place. Yet, we see no anticipation, no expectation, none none of that. We see the forgetfulness of the disciples. Remember, Remember this. This was three days after Jesus died. They had time to think about what had just occurred, his death. As a matter of fact, you can imagine this was the only and this was the main thing that was flooding their minds. Their minds were literally flooded with thoughts on the resurrection of their Lord. It's true. I mean, after spending years with them, seeing, spending so much time with them, of course, that was all that was in their mind. Yet, as, as much as we can tell, there was just weeping and sorrow and despair. No remembering of the things that Jesus taught them. The truth that Jesus taught them, because he taught them great truth, it wasn't in their heart, it wasn't even in the front of their mind, it was somewhere in the back of their mind. Make sense? They did not live in light of the reality of the truth that Jesus himself taught to them. Or think about Peter, the very same night, the very, right, the very same night that Jesus was crucified, hours before, just that night, Jesus told them, told him that he was going to deny him three times. It's, it's like, Peter, just stick it in your mind right here and, and don't forget it. No, we are a forgetful people. Not just them, we're made of the same stuff. It's very true for us here Today, we are prone to forgetfulness. And that's why we're exhorted in Scripture to remember the truth. Remember, we're, we're in the book of Jude. And Jude warns about false teachers in verse 4 that are creeping in. They're penetrating into the church. And what are they doing when they seek to penetrate? They try to bring in their lies. They try to br- lead people astray with their lies, Right? So what should we, Grace Community Church, what should the universal church, how do we combat this? How do we fight the lies, anyone? With the what? Truth. With the truth. You defeat the lies with the truth. And here, Jude wants to remind us of the truth, of a people being saved and a people being destroyed. Think about this. Judah's writing to these people many years after the great exodus, right? But listen to what Moses says in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4 and 9. He's speaking to the very same people who were in that same generation 
of the great exodus. Listen to what he says. This is, this is huge. He says this, only take care and keep your soul diligent lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Listen, these were the Hebrews. They witnessed the exodus. They experienced it. I mean, imagine being by the Twin Towers or maybe you were in the building. Imagine that and you running away. You think you're ever going to forget that? No way. They were not going to forget. It was going to be at least in the back of their mind. That's for sure. But Moses was not concerned about that, was he? He says, lest the truth depart your heart. That's where, where his focus was. That's what he was concerned about. Moses knew the, full, uh, the, the forgetfulness that they were prone to. And again, it's a forgetfulness that we are prone to as well. He exhorts them to keep their soul diligent. And so we should apply that to ourselves and recognize that we're forgetful people and we need to keep our souls diligent as well. So Jude wants to exhort us, calling us to recall an, um, an event, to call to mind something that happened, an event, the Exodus. So let's dive into the Exodus. My second point, God saved a people. Again, verse five, that Jesus or your translation might say the Lord who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so pause real quick. We're going to do some zooming in and zooming out today, okay? What I mean is we're going to zoom in to the great event of the Exodus, and we're going to zoom out, okay? We have, we have phones that zoom in and zoom out. We're used to this. We do this all the time. Let's apply that here and zoom in and zoom out. Now, I trust that the majority of you are at least somewhat familiar with the Exodus. So we're going to skim through the, the story here in Exodus, all right? Zooming in and zooming out. You guys ready? Okay. We see first the salvation of God. God saved Israel out of Egypt. So zooming into Exodus chapter 1. We see in Exodus chapter 1 the great desperate need that the Hebrews had to be rescued and saved. Why? Because it says there that the Egyptians ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. They were completely enslaved to the Egyptians. They were in bondage. And so they ruthlessly, this was, this was no light thing, they worked night and day for these Egyptians. That's who they, their master was. We'll zoom out. We're going to zoom out, okay? Zooming out. Think about us, okay? When I say us, I mean all of humanity. I mean every single person who's ever existed, everyone who exists on the planet now, every, everyone who will exist, every single person that you know. You know a lot of people, right, in your 94, 5 years. There's a lot of people on this earth right now. Every single person that you know. We all need to see ourselves here. We all need to see that we are in a desperate need to be saved and rescued and delivered as well. From what? From our slavery to what? To sin. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 8. He said, whoever practices sin is what? Slave to sin. We need to recognize our need to be rescued and saved from our slavery to sin. And Jesus continued that, what he was saying in John 8. He continued, and what did he say? If, if uh, the Son sets you free, you might be partially free someday in the future. Is that what he says? If the Son sets you free, what? You shall be free indeed. In salvation, guess what? In salvation, we're not only saved from the penalty, from the the penalty of our sin, that's to say forgiveness of our sin. We're not only saved from that. Listen, we are saved from the bondage, from the reign, from the dominion, from the slavery of our sin. So my question to you, everyone in here, have you been set free from your bondage to sin? Well, let's zoom back in. 
Pharaoh commands that every son born of the Hebrews should be put to death. Why did he do this? It's because he feared what happens to baby boys. They eventually become men, correct? And so enough men, enough Hebrew men, and they might have a small, he wanted a small chance of overthrowing the Egyptians. So Pharaoh wanted to just clear up any chance, any, any small confidence that they might have in overthrowing the Egyptians. So Pharaoh had this great plan of his, but you know what? God had a plan. God had a plan. And his plan was to raise up a deliverer from the midst of the Hebrews. So in God's perfect providence, Moses was preserved. He was kept alive by God, even when all the other babies were put to death. God preserved Moses in his plan. Chapter 2, we find Pharaoh's daughter, so Pharaoh's daughter took pity on Moses and took him in to be her son. So get this, out of all the massive population of Egypt, Moses ends up in none other than Pharaoh's own household and becomes Pharaoh's daughter's Son, amazing, right? God in his sovereignty had a plan. He had a design to save and rescue Israel out of Egypt. God had a plan. He used a specific man in a specific land to save and rescue Israel out of Egypt. And he did it in this specific time and context. Now, Zoom out. I want you all to see this. Zoom out. This is exactly what God does in his plan to save sinners. Let me tell you how. Uh, Note this down if you want. Just listen. Acts 17, verses 26 and 27. Having determined, who's who's determining? This is God determining, okay? So God is planning this out. And he says, allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. So periods, time, boundaries, where? Of their dwelling place, whose dwelling place? (laughs) Sinner's dwelling place, our dwelling place, everyone's dwelling place. That, so the reason is, this is why, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. This is why God is orchestrating everything in each and every one of your lives. Do you see that? Just like God placed a certain man, Moses, in this time in Egypt, so has God determined your circumstances, your background, where you would grow up, who, would your, who your family would be, where it would be, when it would be. God orchestrated it all so that you would perhaps find God and be rescued and saved and delivered yourself. That's why. We'll zoom back in. Zoom back into Exodus. From a burning bush, God called Moses to declare to Pharaoh, let my people go. You all familiar with that? Let my people go. Now, think about, I already alluded to this, Egypt was a very powerful country. The Hebrews already had countless babies slaughtered who would have otherwise at this point been strong Hebrew men, right? So the question is, why would Pharaoh just let them go? Quoting Shailen again, he said, that's like a kid with a super soca water gun trying to conquer Spain. So so imagine, yeah, it's funny. Imagine, it's funny to to Pharaoh hearing this, right? If If he doesn't see God with them, It is laughable. Trying to conquer, trying to get out of Egypt was laughable. So this is what I want us all to get. There's no, the the prime of the Hebrew men, they were slaughtered as babies. They had no hope. The Pharaoh would not have just let them go. The Hebrews would have had, if they looked inside, in and of themselves, they had absolutely zero hope, no chance of escaping 
Egypt. Now zoom out. I want us all to see ourselves right here. Look within yourself. If you look within yourself, you have absolutely zero chance. You have no hope to be saved. None. Outside of God. Apart from God coming in and performing a supernatural, miraculous work by His hand alone, what hope do any of us have? We don't have any hope. Ephesians chapter 2 says that you were handicapped in your trespasses and sins. Is that how it goes? You were very, very sick. Is that how it goes? How does it go? And you were what? Dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Having no ability, dead people don't have ability to do anything. No ability to come to Christ and be saved. Verse one, two, verses 1, 2, and 3 kind of displays that more. But you know what? There's a verse 4. How does verse 4 start? But, but God. But God. There is a but God. We can talk about Ephesians chapter 1 and see how dead we are. But there's a verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Listen to me. We were dead. Not sick, not handicapped. We were dead. But God, we were without hope. No hope, no hope at all. Zero. But God... Some of you can't say we were. Some of you have to say we are. You are dead. But God, it's still true. But God, it's still true. Zooming in. We see the but God. Continuing in Exodus. God's mighty saving hand here in Exodus. God sends ten mighty plagues against the Egyptians. Some of you are familiar with this. He turned the Nile to blood. He covered the land with frogs, gnats, flies. He covered, or I'm sorry, he caused the livestock to die. Uh, he caused boils on the Egyptians, sent heavy hail, locusts, and thick darkness. This was Egypt. And during each and every one of those plagues, guess what? <clears throat> the Hebrews were spared. It didn't touch them. You guys know what I'm, where I'm going at here, zooming out? The wrath of God, the plagues of God is coming over the whole face of the planet. God's wrath is coming. But guess what? Christians will be spared. Christians alone will be spared. God himself will protect us from this wrath. And the last plague, it explains how he does that. The last plague is the death of the firstborn. The Hebrews were to take a lamb without blemish a year old. They were to kill the lamb, uh, take some of the blood, and apply it on the doorpost and the lintel. And guess what happened? If the blood was not applied, then there was death. The firstborn of that house died. This is a beautiful picture of Christ. This is a type of Christ. And I am not just making this up because it sounds nice. I'm not just trying to manipulate this so that you guys can have a good entertaining uh, sermon because it sounds nice. No, listen to me. This is what Paul said. Paul himself calls Christ our Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, our Passover lamb. So the Hebrews' only hope is to apply the blood. And your only hope this morning is to apply the blood the blood. There is no other hope. That is why we sing the song. Christians sing the song. What can wash away my sin? I'm sorry, I don't have the best voice, but how does it continue? How do, nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing. There's not one thing that can be added to this. There's not one thing that can take away Your sin in Him, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, that's in Christ. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. 
There is salvation. There is. Praise the Lord that there is salvation, the blood of Christ. But listen to me. This is very important. Listen to me. If you do not have the blood of Christ covering you, listen, the only thing left for you is utter destruction. That's it. You have the blood of Christ covering you or you have destruction. And that's what we see in the last plague. Death in every household who did not have the blood. So Pharaoh, he finally had enough, at least for this moment. And he said, go. The Hebrews are now on their way, at last, on their way to the promised land, the land of the Canaanites, the land flowing with milk and honey. And God was miraculously leading them to the Red Sea. If you remember, it's, uh, we see this in Exodus 13, 21. Just jot it down if you want. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. That's, that's I mean, think about what was going on. God was miraculously leading them. I mean, you, there's no denying that. And we see in Exodus 14, right after that, Pharaoh, eventually, he hardened his heart, and he pursued the, the, the Hebrews with his army. And so Pharaoh's army was drawing near to the Israelites. And they couldn't keep going because the Red Sea was before them. They had mountains on both sides. They were trapped. The Israelites started crying out. Here's the crying out. It begins. They cried out to Moses and it says, It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the wilderness. Moses responds, Fear not. Stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. Think about this. The Israelites already witnessed God's mighty hand at work, sending the plagues. They, they were right there actively witnessing God leading them to the Red Sea. But the Israelites feared this great enemy. And it was a great enemy. It was a, again, a super soaker. Gun, the gun, the super soaker water gun. Without God. That, that's what it was like. This is a great enemy. So, they feared that great enemy more than trusting in the great, greater God who was actively, miraculously saving them right then and there. They did not trust the Lord. They feared the enemy more than trusting in this great God. Well, zoom out. We all need to recognize that we have an enemy, and it's far greater. I mean, none of us together have the resources, the strength to fight this enemy. We have a great enemy, the enemy of sin and death. The enemy of sin and death is great. Very great. But we also need to recognize something else. We also need to see that God is greater. And if he is fighting for us, then guess what? You have only to be silent and trust the Lord who is actively, miraculously saving us. God was fighting for Israel here. He was working out miracles and salvation for them. Now, here's a question for you. Do you see the hand of God working miracles in your life, in yours? Christian, do you? Okay, so here's a question then. Have you had your eyes opened to see something of the glory of Christ, something of the glory of Christ. Have you been transformed from, from being totally blind, seeing only darkness continually, habitually, to, going from that to, seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ? Have you trusted in Christ to save you? Can anybody say yes? Anybody? If that's true, 
And guess what? That's a miracle. That is a miracle. If you deny that salvation is a miracle, if you just think it's just chance and you just made some good decisions and you deny completely that your salvation was a miracle, you might be denying it because you have a man-made salvation. Because God's salvation is always miraculous. It's always supernatural. And listen to me, the greatest miracle, the miracle of miracles is not Lazarus rising from the dead. It's not looking at somebody and being able to heal them of their blindness physically. The miracle of miracles is the miracle of salvation. And God will save. He not, not might save. He will save his people all the way out of Egypt, even when they see obstacles in their path, like the Israelites did here. We will see obstacles in our path as well. Paul t- told us, he promised, you desire to live a godly life, you will see obstacles. There will be problems. There will be persecutions. But guess what? If the Lord is fighting for us, we have only to be silent and trust him who is actively, miraculously saving us. Okay, we'll zoom back into the story. Moses lifted up his staff, stretched out his hands over the sea, and the sea divided so that the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, the water being a wall to them on their left and on their right. As the Egyptians attempted to do the same, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. We see here the greatness of God who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. Listen to me. He has not changed. I don't like hearing that rubbish, that trash, that garbage that says God was one way in the Old Testament and now he's different. That's trash. That is garbage. We don't want to hear any of that here. God is the same. He will save his people. All the way. Speaking about Jesus, the great deliverer and fulfillment of Moses, Matthew 121, you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin. There's no flaw. There's no faultiness in his salvation. His arms are not weakened. They're not shortened. They're not handicapped that it cannot save you. But listen to me, if you will not be saved by God, on his terms, what he has laid out for us, being covered by the blood of Christ, if you will not be saved by him, then the only thing left for you is utter destruction. God destroyed the unbelievers. So who are the unbelievers? Who are the unbelievers that we see here in Jude verse 5? Was it the same people that the Lord saved whom he afterward destroyed? You see the leading question, what, what, what do we make of this? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says there, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So this is clearly talking about the Israelites. They were the ones who were overthrown. These are the same ones who were saved. The same ones. So here's the question. You guys know the question I'm about to ask? Did these people lose their salvation? Did these people lose their salvation? The Lord saved them and then they perished. Okay, no one wants to say yes or no. I'll just, I'll just continue. There's two things to note here. Okay, first, God really did save Israel all the way. He did. The salvation of God was complete. It was perfect and it was lacking in nothing. Israel was saved out of the bondage of the Egyptians. They saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. That was it. They were saved. The second, another thing to consider, Israel was saved in a physical, temporal way, which was meant it was designed to point to a spiritual, eternal, and ultimate salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. The salvation of Israel was a shadow. It was pointing us to a spiritual 
reality. Listen, God saves people all the time. This isn't just this unique situation and circumstance here. God saves people all the time. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, God is the Savior of all people. Yes, this is talking about all people, every person. This is talking about everyone. He saves people from what? From earthly, physical disasters, devastations, sicknesses. We call this common grace. Now, I'm sure this is the case for many of you, but I can tell you that I personally have had so many, so many countless conversations with people who say that they're good with God, they're right with God, they're in right standing, they're in right relationship with God. Why? Because you got to see, you got to see what happened to me. I was involved in this car accident. I should have died. You should see the car. Or, or I, I was shot at. Uh, I had this, this uh, terminal illness and none of the doctors could believe that I walked away. So on and so forth. You guys heard things like this. And they say, God looked out for me. God protected me. God, he has my back. Okay, so we Christians hearing this type of thing, what should we do? Should we try to rebuttal and take what they're saying and trash it down? What should we do? This is how I respond typically. I try to respond and say this. Amen. God saved you. He protected you. He spared your life. He was good to you. That wasn't the devil. That wasn't the demons. That was God himself. He is on the throne. He orchestrated it all and he spared your life. Now, how does that verse go in Romans 2, 4? God's goodness is meant to lead you to think that you're all good with God after you had a traumatic accident. Is that what it says? God's goodness is meant, it's designed, you said it, to lead us to repentance. And without repentance, you will perish. That's what Jesus said in Luke 13, 3. You will perish. You will go to hell without repentance. So, we see for the majority of the Israelites, they were unrepentant. They were full of unbelief. Numbers 14, 22, it tells us that the Israelites put the Lord to the test 10 times. We don't have the time to go through every single one of these, but I want to go through several. Because of these testings from Israel, the Lord promised that they would perish. So let's, let's go into that. Again, I, I trust most of you are somewhat familiar with their uh, rebellion. And so I'm just going to quote the chapter. And if you could listen. Exodus 15. The Hebrews shortly after singing and celebrating, they were celebrating the salvation of God. They were in total wonder of all of this. We see them there grumbling and complaining. They complained, why? Because they had water there, but they couldn't drink it because it was bitter. So what does Moses do? He throws a log. Anybody seen this? Throwing a log into water and turning it from bitter to sweet. Anybody seen that? It's something you just don't see every day. It's just amazing. Yet, what happened after that? They continued to complain, grumble in their unbelief. Chapter 16. Now they're grumbling and complaining because do they have a good excuse? Oh, they're hungry now. Well, before they were thirsty, now they're hungry. So what's going to happen now? There's nothing. There's no way that we can get food. They're rebelling. They're complaining. And what happens? God literally has bread coming down from heaven. They call it manna. And yet, their rebellion continued. Chapter 17. The people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Now, let's recap real quick. Okay, they saw God's mighty hand against the Egyptians with the ten plagues. They saw and witnessed God leading them to the Red Sea. They saw the Red Sea split. They crossed over. They looked back and the Egyptians are dead. Not just that, they cross over, the salvation of God is complete, and then they're here on the other side, they're celebrating, then they don't have water, or the water is bitter, so they're turned into sweet. Okay, and then they have manna. 
And now they're complaining again because there is no water. Before, at least there was water. Now there's no water. Now there's no way that God can help us. After all that they saw, well, what happened? God, in his patience, nevertheless, had water coming out of a rock, <laughs> of all things, a rock. And so what happened after that? Well, surely after that, they, the, the Israelites stopped their complaining. They were done with that. No, it continued. Now, I can see maybe some people hearing this story and thinking to themselves, how can they continue in this state? How is that possible? If I saw these miracles, if I saw and felt the ex experience, what they did, what they saw, what they experienced, I would never continue in this unbelief. Never. Well, two things to note. First, you do not need to see these specific miracles to know the miraculous grace of God in His goodness and His kindness displayed to you even while you sit here today. How? Think about it. Think about all the ways that God is literally keeping you, sustaining your life even right now. Your body, for example. Your heart is pumping. We talked about Kevin on Wednesday. I mean, and, and Rick, I mean, our heart is pumping without us even thinking. Blood is flowing to the major organs, again, without us even thinking. Our lungs, I mean, countless things in our body, we can't even mention, that are simultaneously working. And all of that is keeping us alive. Let alone the things outside of our bodies that are essential for life. Our bodies, our life, it's a miracle from God. It is. It's a miracle. Second, another thing to consider, saying that you would never continue in this state, if you saw what they saw, if you experienced what they did, is ignoring the fact that each and every one of us here have something, have access to something greater than they ever did. What is it? What is it? His word, Christ. His word here. We have access to something greater. Even on our cell phones, we have it. We have access to something greater than they ever had. They never had what we have, each and every one of us have before us here today. And this is what Jesus said. He said it's going to be more tolerable. He said it's going to be more bearable, more better, better for Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be more tolerable for them, basically, than for those who have greater light and ignore it and suppress it. It's going to be greater for... You know what Sodom and Gomorrah did, right? I mean, they did a lot of things, but one of the things they did, they tried to rape angels. Listen, it's going to be more bearable for them than for those who have greater light and suppress the truth. We can read about the light that came into the world. The, the kids are learning about John 1. The Word became flesh. We can read about that. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We can read about that. Don't be like the Hebrews. Don't be like them who forgot that God was actively, presently working miracles on their behalf. Don't be like the Hebrews who just got used to it. They got accustomed to God's goodness toward them, kind of like what we do with our bodies, with our life, with the Bible. Don't be like the Hebrews who just got used to the goodness of God on them. Don't be like the Hebrews who just got used to it. They took it for granted and lived their lives in constant rebellion and unbelief towards the Lord. The Lord overthrew the Egyptians. I'm sorry, the Israelites. And the Lord will overthrow us as well. So question, is your life characterized? Is it characterized? Are you enslaved? We talk about being enslaved. Are you enslaved to grumbling? Complaining, unbelief, rebellion against the Lord. Well, I'm willing to bet most in here and even most outside, if they hear that question, they would emphatically de de deny that and say, no way, Jose, that's not me, right? But you know what? The Egypt, I'm sorry, the Israelites, we're talking about the Israelites, the Israelites would have emphatically 
denied it as well. Listen to what they say as they grumbled. Listen to what Moses said in response to their grumbling. He said this, Who are we that you grumble against us? Your grumbling is against the Lord. The Hebrews, you can tell right there, they thought that their grumbling was directed mainly and only to, toward Moses and Aaron. But the fact is their grumbling was toward the Lord. So again, are you enslaved to, are you consumed by constant grumbling with regards to your situation, your circumstances in life, the funds you have, the funds you wish you have, the spouse, the job, the health you wish you had? Realize this, realize that he who is sitting on the throne, again, he is sovereign. He is orchestrating everything in your life for you to be where you are, for you to have what you have. So guess what? Who are you rebelling against? Who are you complaining against? It's the Lord. That's the one. He is the one who you're grumbling against. And that's a very scary thing. We're talking about the Israelites and what they did. That's a scary thing to know you're doing the exact thing that they did. We're continuing. We have a couple more examples and I'm done. The Israelites continue to rebel. Chapter 32 of Exodus. They made for themselves a golden calf to be their God. Now again, you may be thinking, that's not me. Okay, th that stop, it stops there. That's not me. I would never, ever do that. I'm not like the Catholics. I'm not like uh, the Hindus over there. I'm not like them. I would never form a statue and create my own God. But here's the question. What do you live for? What do you live for? What is your heart filled with passion for? What are your desires? What do you fantasize? What is going on in your mind that you just think about all day long? What is it? If it's not the Lord God, then there's your golden calf right there. But throughout the wilderness, <laughs> time and time and time and time again, the Hebrews rebelled in their unbelief. And finally at the end, Numbers 13, spies were sent out to the land of Canaan. The land of the promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. And the report came back. The spies that were sent out reported back. He said, they said, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Now listen what the Israelites, after, again, after everything that they saw and experienced, listen to what they say. They say, then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better to go back to Egypt? I mean, they're at the brink. They're at the very border. They're right there. They're at the very brink of entering the land flowing with milk and honey. The, the spies already confirmed the word of the Lord. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The Lord already promised this land is for Israel. He already promised that. But they rebelled in their unbelief, and they would not enter the land. After this, God declared that everyone who grumbled against him age 20 and up would perish, except for Joshua and Caleb. They believed the Lord, and the Lord took them to the promised land. The other spies, they died in a plague that God brought to them. Israel was defeated in battle. The Lord, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Listen, God did everything. There was not one thing lacking. He did everything leading these people into this land. He did everything to bring them to this land flowing with milk and honey. Yet in unbelief, they would not enter. Israel, after knowing and seeing and beholding, experiencing the truth, they apostatized in their unbelief. So my question here for all of us today, will you do the same? I'm not just talking about everyone out, outside of here. I'm even talking about members of this church. Will you do the same? The promised land is a shadow. Heaven is the reality. Will you trust the Lord? 
Will you walk by faith into the promised land or will you stand at the very edge looking, hearing about it, but never entering in yourself? I mean, how does it look like to hear about it, to see it from afar? I mean, everyone sitting here is hearing the word of God. Everyone again has access to the word of God. You're at the very brink of entering, but in your unbelief, you might just stay there. Don't be like the Hebrews. Don't be like them. God destroyed those who did not believe then, and again, he is the same God, same God. There's, there's no difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will destroy those now. He has not changed. Behold the great extent of the Lord God Almighty doing everything, leading these people to the promised land. And again, the Lord has done so. He's worked out so many things in your life to lead you to the promised land as well. Will you answer by faith, trusting in the Son of God? Will you do that? Or will you continue in your unbelief and be destroyed, falling short of this great promised land? There's no other option. You either enter by faith. You can't just be indifferent and think you're in the middle. You either enter by faith or you continue in unbelief and you're destroyed. Again, Jude is reminding us here of what God already has done to the unbelievers. This book, the Bible, is full of warnings. It's full of warnings. And it's a loving thing to warn. God warns us. Jude warns us here. It's a loving thing to warn. Will you heed the warning? Will you ignore the warning? The salvation, again, the salvation of God is perfect. He will not fail to fully save you completely. However, the damnation, the destruction of God is perfect and he will not fail he will not fall short he will not rest until you're fully damned he will fully condemn you you will be fully destroyed the lord saved the hebrews thousands of years ago he will save you from your sin today the reminder of my mother-in-law regarding 9 11 or regarding any event cannot be compared it pales in comparison to this great event that Jude would have us fix our mind to mind on. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I I pray, Lord, that I, that all of us would not take it for granted, that we would heed your word, your truth, your warning, Lord. Help us, Lord, today to glorify you. In the name of your Son. Amen.